So this week's scripture reading sounds a little funny from the RSV, no offense to the translators of the RSV. And so we will be reading, although the board will read RSV, I will be reading from the NIV version this week only. So please forgive me, be patient. May God's blessing fall on the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of these words. That power is like the working of God's mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed Jesus to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. We know these words to be trustworthy and true. Let us pray. God Almighty, we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus, this Jesus who is seated at your right hand, we pray in his name that you bless us this morning and that you pour into me the gift of preaching and pour into your congregation a hunger and a thirst to be fed by you. It's in the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. This is the last of our three-week sermon series based on the three gifts that the wise men laid at the feet of Jesus Christ. If you've been with us, great. If not, I'm going to do a simple, quick recap of where we've come from. The three wise men left three, uh, the, th the wise men left three gifts at the feet of Jesus, proclaiming him to be the fulfillment of three key leadership roles for the Jewish people, the Israelites. Harkening back to the Old Testament mind, they were saying that Jesus is going to be the fulfillment of the three ways this country was led. In the back, way back in history, those three elements, those three leadership influence positions were to be a king, the other was to be a prophet, and the other was to be a great high priest. Those were always separate people, of course, filling those roles. It would be dangerous to have one person filling all three. But finally, in Jesus, the wise men lay these gifts down at his feet and say, this is the one. He's the Messiah. He's the one we can trust to fulfill all three roles for the people. And Christians say, and he can fill all three roles for me, too. We started with the representation of the myrrh at the beginning. Myrrh, just one more time, was the basic ingredient um, for embalming fluid, for embalming a dead body. And to have that gift presented at the feet of a baby, of a little boy, would stun the parents, of course. It was saying something. It wasn't an actually an appropriate gift to give a kid. In fact, none of these gifts were appropriate. Gold? Who gives baby a gold? But hey. And they lay this myrrh at his feet, saying that this child is going to grow up and meet an, a sudden death, uh, a certain death, that's, that's uh, well before his time. Uh, Jesus died. I'm, tw I'm 32 years old. Just imagine. And 33 really wasn't the prime of his life. He should have had more years after that. And so looking at this gift, the, the mom and dad, Joseph and Mary, said, well, there's embalming fluid sitting on our floor. And they knew more than that. They knew that this symbolized that this baby was to grow up and become our prophet. The only um, vocation in that era, in that time, that guaranteed you to have suffering and to have a hard death. And so the first gift says that Jesus Christ is going to grow up and be our prophet. That when he speaks, we hear from God. The basic Old Testament role of a prophet was to represent God before humans. And so, as the wise men did, Christians stop every time this year. After Christmas, we always have the three wise men, don't we? We pause, and we likewise lay the same gifts at the feet of Jesus, claiming him in the same ways. This baby is the one I listen to. If I want to know about God, I read the red letters. If I want to see anything or taste God or know God or hear from God, I've got to find Jesus. He's my 
prophet. There are a lot of voices out there that think they know about God. There's a lot of preachers, there's a lot of uh, theologians, and there's a lot of well-to-do people or, or kind people. But Jesus is the one I'm after. He is my prophet. That was our first week. Our second week, last week, was that the wise men laid down the gift of the frankincense. And frankincense, if you remember, was the basic tool and instrument for the great high priesthood. It would be like, to give frankincense to a baby would be like showing up to a baby shower and giving him a Bible and a, and a uh, communion chalice. It's a statement saying that this kid's going to grow up and be a preacher. And so by laying down this gift, they were saying that Jesus Christ wasn't just our prophet, but that he was going to grow up and become our great high priest. And if you remember from last week, I know you memorize all my sermons, so, but I'll tell you just in case. Last week, we, we defined the role of the prophet as reverse of the, uh, the, of the priest as the reverse of the role of the prophet. The prophet goes before humans to represent God. The priest goes before God to represent humans. I taught one of the Sunday school classes last week and asked the question, if you were charged as the representative, representative person uh, to go before God on behalf of all humanity, what would you say? I'm sorry, there's no excuse for this. What if somebody had to go and just represent you alone, not the rest of humanity? What would they have to say before God for you? Well, Jesus' role as a priest was to go before God and, and, and do things that we couldn't do on our behalf. And it's important for us to pause like the wise men did, laying the gift of frankincense at his feet also, saying that I need somebody to go before me, on behalf of me, to God. And that somebody is not any preacher, it's not any elders in the church. That somebody I want to go before me is Jesus. He's the purity. He's the one who's in with the Father. And this week we end on the last gift, on the gold. The wise men traveled all the way to Bethlehem and they laid gold at the feet of a child. Now it's important to know that culturally in those times, the standard gift to give between royalty was gold. In 1 Kings chapter 10, King Solomon, that's King David's son, is, has inherited this great kingdom. He's known as a wise king. It's a good time economically for the kingdom. He has somebody pay him a visit. It's the queen of Sheba has come up from Africa to come and, and hang out with King uh, Solomon. And when she comes to King Solomon, she recognizes the power of his kingdom and the wealth in his kingdom, and she hands over to him, according to the story, 120 talents of gold. If you remember when we did a stewardship series, one talent is worth uh, 15 years' wages for an average day for a worker, a laborer. So 120 talents, somebody do the math and tell me afterward. A lot of gold is what queen, the Queen of Sheba gave King Solomon, just as an exchange uh, out of her honoring him. She also gave him spices and, and precious jewels. And at the end of the story, when, when queen, uh, the Queen of Sheba is leaving to head back to um, wherever she was from, Ethiopia is what somebody told me, as she's heading back, King Solomon opens up his treasures and says, you take what you want. It was just a standard way of exchange, of honoring other royalty, is to exchange gold with each other. And so for the wise men to lay down gold at the feet of Jesus, back then, everybody knew what that meant. It meant that this baby boy was going to grow up and become our king. Now the wise men traveled all the way to Jerusalem, it says at first, because they, they saw the star in the sky. They, they were well-versed on uh, astrology, and, and they saw that, that, that uh, the lion in the, st in the sky represented the kingdom of Judah, and the star had come at the right time, and, th and they read the prophecy and said, there's a king to be born in Judah. And so they loaded up in their, in their caravan. I've been writing the sermon. I was thinking about that, that Cadillac Escalade commercial, you know, with the Queen of Sheba, and then the guy on the elephant, and then the the, the lady on the carriage, and it's, you know, they, they load up in these royal caravans and, and start heading out to find this newborn king. And they make it all the way to Jerusalem. The reason they assumed Jerusalem was because that's where the palace was, the temple, that's the city of David. So they went into this, well, this is the city he founded. So they went into this city of Jerusalem saying, where's the king? Of course, the current king, King Herod, threw a hissy fit and told him, get out of here and tell me when you find this child, and I will go and pay him homage. 
And so they had to back their Escalade up and say, well, I guess he's not here. And they traveled to a place called Bethlehem, which is practically driving to the wrong side of town to an apartment complex to find this newborn king. And the family that, that the wise men found didn't look like a royal family at all. Of course, they moved out of the manger by then. You don't stay in a manger for two years. They had established themselves in Bethlehem. Joseph didn't look like a, a king and Mary or queen. And this baby just looked like a little boy. They could have put it in reverse and headed back and said, we made a mistake. But they didn't. They took this precious gold and they laid it at the feet. And they said in that action, hail, King Jesus. Hail, Lord Jesus. We end this series with the gifts of the wise men by pausing and saying, I know I need Jesus to be my prophet. I know I need somebody to show me what God is like. And I know I need somebody to go before me on my behalf. Protestants just call him Savior. It's the same idea, to have a priest go before you, to handle your affairs. And we end by saying, and I now know that I need somebody to lead me. I need somebody to obey that will lead me into newness of life. Now in the scriptures, the word for king, to claim somebody as your king, in Greek is basileus, which is the same word used for ruler or emperor. And so by the time Jesus stands before Pilate at age 33, before his crucifixion, he is saying, I am an emperor, I am a basileus, I am, I am in opposition to the kingdom, to the empire of Rome. You could see the threat and the problem that Pilate had at that point. Basileus meant that unilaterally, no matter what the king or the emperor wanted, it happened. Now, another word we use for Jesus that Christians use isn't Basileus, it's Kyrios, which means Lord. We use that all the time. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Curios, that second word, means Lord or Master or Rabbi or Sir. It's somebody that you voluntarily enter into a relationship with and you recognize the authority and the influence they have over you. The difference between a Lord, a Curios, and a King or a Basileus is that everybody has to obey the King. In the words of the scriptures, as King Jesus, even the seas obey him. And so what's the role of the king? If the role of the priest is to go before God on your behalf, and if the role of the prophet is to come on God's behalf before you and reveal things about God, what's the role of the king in our lives? Well, just doing quick study, it's everything that the prophet and the priest don't do. The king's job is, I call it the rubber hitting the road type work in ministry. In the old kingdom of King David, the king's role was to keep everybody safe, to defend the, the empire, His role was to make sure the economy was running well, so in that way he would provide for the people. It was the king's job to execute justice and righteousness in the kingdom. If there was an ongoing bitterness uh, or or an affair in the kingdom that was was creating divisiveness, it was the king's job to go and handle it. Of course, the king was always checked and held in balance by the prophet and the priest so that when the king executed justice or led... He was influenced by the prophecy, and he also knew that he was, through his priest, going to have to stand accountable to God. That's a pretty big boss. And so the king, knowing these things, would lead the people in righteousness. And so to say that we need a king, and that Jesus is the one to fulfill this role, is saying that we need somebody to be handling the nitty-gritty life that we live in. We need somebody to pray to, to provide for us, to guide us, to help us. We need somebody to obey. We need help. It's one thing to have somebody go before you and forgive your sins or help you in the background. It's another thing to receive inspiration from God. But it's a whole other thing to have somebody take you by the hand and say, follow me. Now Christians, today, we live in a time where the kingdom has been secured, it's been victoriously claimed through the Christ, and yet it's not fully worked out. We still pray the Lord's Prayer for 2,000 years. Thy kingdom come, which means it's here, but it's not fully here. And as we live in this in-between time, knowing that the deal is sealed and yet not worked out fully, Christians live voluntarily as if it's here. 
And we do that by claiming Jesus Christ as our Lord, as our Kyrios. We walk intimately with him. We, we let him hold our hand. We, we seek his guidance. Mature Christians say it's one thing to have a Savior, to have somebody handle your affairs when you're after the grave. It's another thing to have somebody be your Lord to guide you today. That's the hard move. But Christians humbly claim Jesus Christ as a Lord, as somebody that can guide and to keep us, knowing very well that as Philippians 2 promises, when Jesus comes and his kingdom is complete and his authority is made evident for everybody, I'll use the words of the scriptures, when Jesus comes, every knee will bend and every tongue will confess. At that moment, there will be no doubt of the kingship, of the ruling of Jesus Christ over his creation. And his first act, this is good news for Christians, his first act as king, it says, and they will confess what? They will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. His first act when, God, when Jesus comes in the flesh to grab his kingdom and start leading like King David led, the first thing he wants to do is to be the intimate leader of every individual person on the planet. He doesn't want to lead from a mighty throne far away and be spiteful and merciless. He wants to walk beside you. Yes, he wants to be the king in which everything obeys him, but at the same time, he wants to know you by name. He wants to guide you by the hand. He cares about being your Lord, your rabbi, your master. Christians, we're just practicing. We're practicing today for tomorrow. We're living like that kingdom is fully established today, knowing that it will be, hoping for tomorrow. Because when tomorrow comes, when the kingdom is established, nothing that takes place on earth will disturb Jesus or disappoint Jesus because he's going to get what he wants. And the first thing that he's going to want is your obedience. He's going to want you wanting to be led by him. Can you imagine having somebody in absolute leadership, full-on sovereignty, where nobody can question them and you like it? (laughs) Can you imagine that? To have that one role set up and knowing that, geez, I don't know who's going to fill this role. And then you find out it's Jesus. Think, I'll take it. I'll take it. Because at that point, everybody else too will obey. Everybody else too will live under that care, under that sovereignty. It was understood in the Old Testament and it was understood in the days of the Magi that the people needed a prophet, a priest, and a king. There wasn't any question. The question is, who is going to fill that role? And the wise men said, he's going to do it. He's the one. He's the one we've been waiting for. As the church says, he's the Christ. He is the role filler, Jesus Christ. And as a king, he's both and. He's both sovereign and powerful and wise and, I mean, powerful and He knows you intimately. He's peaceful. He's merciful. He's gentle. He's also your priest. What a king. As we pause at the feet of Jesus as this year begins, before we get anywhere near Lent and follow Jesus as our disciple maker, it's important that we say before he says one word or stands on his own two feet, he is the one I choose to obey. He's the one I choose to follow because I need to follow someone. Make it be Jesus. Let us pray. Lord in heaven, we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, the king of the nations, we pray that until that day fully unravels and is made imminent before the world's eyes, that he would be king of our homes, king of our hearts. We pray that not only would we long to hear his voice and long to have him represent us before you, that we would care enough to obey what he says. We pray that this week we would take steps of faith that lead to righteousness. We pray that we learn through uh, trial and error that when we walk in faithfulness to your son, Jesus Christ, we have life and we have it abundantly. We pray that through obedience we would find this life and that we would live uh, lives that are attractive to others that want to enter into the lordship of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you for the mysteries of your creation, for the answers you've given us in Jesus. We thank you for making everything complete, not leaving us to our own devices, and for finding us a way to live well. 
Give us this life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.